with the different type of fatty acid sources, as I didn't mention previously, but now I will mention, uh, we fed a palmitic acid supplement, a high palmitic acid supplement. We also fed a calcium salt, and then we fed a combination of whole cotton seed and canola oil, in which, in surprisingly, we saw the greatest uh, responses to our oil diet, which was our whole cotton seed and canola oil combination, which, you know, generally with unsaturated fatty acids, you're going to get a little bit of milk fat depression and a little bit of disruptions in the rumen environment. And we didn't seem to get that, but we also questioned the type of basal diet that we were feeding since the forage to concentrate ratio was about 42 to 58. So we didn't have a lot of forage, meaning that all of that energy was coming from the high byproduct and also the fatty acid sources that we were feeding. So hello everyone, this is Luis Ferreira with the Dairy Nutrition Black Belt Podcast. And today we will be discussing about what are the effects of dietary fatty acids on milk production and methane emissions in cows fed either ISO or non-ISO energetic diets. And to help us to navigate through this very uh, intriguing topic, we've, we have Victoria Ramos, which is a master's student at the Cornell University uh, and run a very nice study about this topic. So. First and foremost, uh, welcome, Vitoria. Thank you so much for joining us for this podcast. But before we dive into this uh, study, tell us a little bit about yourself. Hi, thank you so much for the introduction. So my name is Victoria Ramos. I'm originally from Tucson, Arizona, and I did my undergraduate degree at the University of Arizona in animal sciences with a emphasis in animal industry, where I worked with various professors such as Dr. Duarte Diaz and Dr. Duane Wolf. And from there, I came to Cornell and now focused on mitigating methane emissions with Dr. Joseph McFadden. So excited to talk about more about that. It doesn't have to be this hard to keep cows pregnant. At Verdius Nutrition, we understand the negative impact that lost pregnancies have on a dairy's economics. Every failed pregnancy means more money spent on expensive semen, additional replacements to raise, and fewer valuable beef calves to sell. Feed what embryos need. Strata with EPA DHA, the pregnancy nutrient. You have this very curious study where, where you try to manipulate the, the, the diets to better understand how cows would react to that. So from your perspective, tell us a little bit about the purpose of this experiment. So the purpose of this experiment was, you know, obviously to mitigate methane emissions, enteric methane emissions from dairy cows, specifically Holstein cows. But the only difference was that this experiment was a Western diet, meaning that we did California diets on a Northeast dairy farm in New York, in Ithaca, New York. So the purpose was to basically look at different dietary fatty acid and products to see the different effects of methane emissions, because as we all know, not all fats are equal. So we kind of have to see that effect when we're replacing different substrates, such as fiber or starch, which fiber and starch, as we all know, it's the most crucial carbohydrate in the dairy cow's diet. So when we replace those, what are we getting from? Where is that energy coming from? Either the fatty acids or either the basal diet structure. So our main purpose was to look at, you know, what what do unsaturated versus saturated or protected fatty acids do? And we kind of did all of those different fatty acid sources. We kind of went one by one, so, sort of saturated and then protected and then unsaturated. You know, there's a lot of extensive research out there that tells us the effects, but looking at it differently when we're replacing these major substrates in the diet and also isoenergetic, meaning let's see when we're also combining the same energy density and feeding the same type of energy to these cows. And before we, before we get into those diets and uh, all, all your results, right, you just mentioned a California type of diet in a New York dairy. So, so tell, us, tell us more about that. Uh, wh why did you decide to do that? And did you, did you experience any challenges associated with that? Gu guide us through this process. We wanted to mimic what they were doing on Western farms. So we had to ship in uh, almond hulls and our diets had to consist of a lot of byproduct, heavy byproducts. Since California and Western regions, 
rely heavily on byproducts to fulfill the requirement to the dairy cow. So it was very different than what we usually do in Northeast, where we feed a lot of corn silage and a lot of haylage. Although we did feed corn silage in our diets, it was not as drastic as we would feed here in New York. Um, so we had to ship in almond holes from California. We also fed sources, our other forage sources like alfalfa hay, which, you know, could help us meet that forage requirement that these cows need. But it was very fun trying to balance out all these byproducts. Like we even added chocolate in these diets and we even added, you know, other sorts of, you know, wheat mids and try to fulfill you know, what they need, you know? So it was it was a little bit challenging since we were not used to feeding these type of diets, especially on a Northeast setting, trying to, you know, decrease the water availability of how much the dry matter was going to be here. And also trying to recover, you know, how much what the non-forage fiber substance was going to be, such as, you know, we could either add wheat mids or we could either add almond holes since almond holes are really great in, you know, NDF. And also use a lot of corn as corn meal to fulfill our starch requirements. So when we were replacing these with fatty acids, it, it was a little bit challenging trying to balance how well we were going to feed these fatty acids as well as replacing the most crucial substrate in the diet. Absolutely. Wow. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah, it sounds really interesting to see how to feed these very different diets to cows that are not used to this type of diet. But you work with two very, very different diets, I'm assuming, right? An isoenergetic and a non-isoenergetic diet uh, when, when testing those fatty acids. So tell us more about that. How did you design those and the purpose and everything related to that? So our idea was, since there's a lot of research that doesn't really emphasize the use of isoenergetic diets, our our main goal was to see, okay, we have one plot that's going to be non-isoenergetic, meaning that we did not control for the energy density of the diet versus in our other plot, it was going to be isoenergetic, meaning that the energy density of the diet was going to be equal across all treatments that we were feeding. So our main goal was to ask ourselves, where is that energy coming from? Is that energy coming from the most abundant carbohydrate source, either fiber or starch in the diet, or is it coming from the fatty acid? And what we saw, we saw very different effects of it since there was, you know, potentially higher fiber in one plot and higher starch in one plot. And as we're all familiar with, you know, starch could give us lower methane emissions versus fiber can give us higher methane emissions. So that's kind of the question that we were trying to ask where how could we replace this type of substrates versus the fatty acid source and with also maintaining the same energy to see what diet and what fatty acid was actually working correctly in that isoenergetic diet. So tell us a little bit about the effects of dietary fatty acids. Did you find any risks or downsides to feeding fats to those cows? So, you know, with all fatty acids, we have to question the type of fatty acid profile and, you know, how they react in the environments of the rumen as well, and also the absorption. With the different type of fatty acid sources, as I didn't mention previously, but now I will mention, uh, we fed a palmitic acid supplement, a high palmitic acid supplement. We also fed a calcium salt, and then we fed a combination of whole cotton seed and canola oil, in which, in surprisingly, we saw the greatest uh, responses to our oil diet, which was our whole cotton seed and canola oil combination, which, you know, generally with unsaturated fatty acids, you're going to get a little bit of milk fat depression and a little bit of disruptions in the rumen environment. And we didn't seem to get that, but we also questioned the type of basal diet that we were feeding since the forage to concentrate ratio was about 42 to 58. So we didn't have a lot of forage, meaning that all of that energy was coming from the high byproduct and also the fatty acid sources that we were feeding. But with other downside, I think that feeding a lot of starch could also help us, I mean, could also tell us a lot of stories and where that digestibility is going. Since we did get a lot of decreased digestibility, but it also would question the low, fi the low fiber, the low forage in the diet, which didn't help us see a lot of responses, but it did help us get a lot of great 
methane, enteric methane emission responses, we did see very low values, which is what we wanted originally. We didn't get a response to decreases, but overall, these cows were consuming about 33 33 kilos of dry matter intake, which is very high, but it's it's common for high concentrate sources, high concentrate feeding. And but still, these cows were producing about 300 to 380 grams of methane per day, which is very, very low compared to what they were eating and how much milk they were producing, producing about 45 kilos. It was it was very interesting to see where, you know, that that story of the digestibility and the methane emissions and how much they were eating. So I think that the question is, we still need to ask ourselves more about saturated fatty acids. What is the common goal? What are we trying to achieve? And what we saw, we saw good responses since what we wanted to see is high milk production, low in methane emissions. But it's also questioning how well do these work and also with the type of different diets. You know, what if we did this diet in a northeast setting as well? What if we fed higher corn silage or higher forage? What would we get the same response or not? So it was really cool to see the effects that we got. And it's a really good story to tell because not a lot of research has shown what we saw, but it was nice. No, absolutely. Very intriguing study. Uh, and I'm really looking forward to when this publication comes out because I'm definitely intrigued about reading and digesting all this cool information that you shared with us. Uh, so, so thank you for sharing all of that. To finalize, tell us if you could test something else now that you know all those responses What do you think we should be doing next to better understand uh, either methane emissions or production uh, by dairy cows? I think that for my next goal, if I were to do something else with this experiment, was to dive a little bit deeper in saturated fatty acids or products that are out there, like looking at more calcium salts or either high palmitic acid supplement or even stearic. What are these effects on methane emissions? There's a lot of limited research out there. And there's a lot of research saying that you know, fatty acids do decrease methane emissions. But in my case, we didn't really get that. We did get very decreased, you know, values, but we did not get a response and decrease. So what I would want to do is actually, you know, question that assumption that we think that all fatty acids are going to decrease methane emissions and also what type of fatty acids. We know unsaturated fatty acids have a lot of potential, but what about the fatty acids that are actually helping us achieve those milk components, the milk production, like palmitic acid versus, you know, what can we do better in the diet or in what setting or in what region can we help question? No, absolutely. A lot of intriguing questions for uh, future research. And I hope someone will tackle all of those so we can keep learning and make sure people can utilize that in the field. So thanks again, uh, Victoria, for joining us today. And thank you at home uh, for joining the podcast. And I hope to see you soon.